everyone. Um, my name is Grace Hike. I'm um, coming to you from the Glencoe Public Library. And we are really pleased to present a program with Daniel Suarez of Audubon Great Lakes tonight on bird migration in the Chicago area. Um, we are in webinar mode, uh, which means that you we cannot see or hear you, um, but um, um, we certainly are glad you're here. And if you have any questions for Mr. Suarez after he, he does his presentation, you are very, very welcome to put your questions into the chat or into the Q&A. Actually, you can put them in any time. And I would be happy to ask your questions on your behalf. Um, tonight's program is sponsored by not only the library, but the Friends of the Green Bay Trail, the Glencoe Community Garden, and the Glencoe Sustainability Task Force. And a special shout out to Hall Healy, um, who is with us here on the screen. Um, Hall is, is a um, very committed bird activist and, um, and community do-gooder of the first rank. Um, so thank you very much, Hall, for your, your share in bringing this program to us tonight. Uh, we are recording tonight's program, so if you um, want to see it again, or you want to share it, or um, if you have to leave early, you, you can see the entire thing. Um, it'll be posted on the library's YouTube channel. Um, early next week, we're going to email the link to everyone who registered for the program. So you, you're welcome to share it or use it however you like. And it's up indefinitely. Um, so, um, oh, I want to mention that on June 22nd, we're having a second bird program um, called What's That Bird? Bird Identification Basics. Um, and that is going to be with a, um, a co-worker of our presenter tonight, um, Refugio Mariscal, from, also from Audubon Great Lakes. And that will, you will learn about birds commonly found on the North Shore and basic approaches to bird ID, including some helpful tools. So that will be a lot of fun and that will be on June 22nd. I'm gonna put that information into the chat also. Uh, let's see, oh, um, before we get started, I wanted to launch just a tiny poll um, to ask people, ask you how many people are watching on your screen tonight. So if you could do that for me, I'd appreciate it. I'm now going to hand this over to Hall, who is going to introduce our speaker tonight, Daniel Suarez. And Hall is also going to tell you about a very fun little contest that, that uh, the Sustainability Task Force has going to elect a bird mascot for Glencoe. So um, over to you, Hall. Thank you, Grace. And thank everyone for being here and you and, and Daniel and Sandy Culver and Helen Latham who have helped put this program together in spades. There are, Daniel can correct me if I'm wrong, but there are at least nine to 10,000 species of birds, maybe as many as 18,000, according to some numbers. And there's hardly a day that you can spend in Glencoe without seeing or hearing at least one bird, even in the dead of winter. They are important to us because they, they use the same and need the same habitats that we do, but they're also fun and a joy. Uh, even the robin I saw on our lawn this morning was a joy to see among all the diamond studded uh, dewdrop uh, blades of grass that were there. Um, birds have inspired us since we have been around. Uh, from Icarus, the Greek god who had wax wings and when he got too close to the sun, he found out what happened. Uh, but also the Wright brothers were inspired by birds and we know the result of that. Uh, they need the same habitats we do, and that's why it's important, one of the reasons why it's important to protect them. Daniel is the ideal person to talk with us tonight as the stewardship program manager for Audubon Great Lakes. He is involved in fundraising and managing smaller and larger large-scale restoration projects throughout the Midwest and he's done some fantastic work and he's going to tell us a bit about that tonight, but also about the basics about why birds migrate. And I've read books about this, Daniel, and I hope you'll explain the latest theory on why birds can fly from here halfway around the world. Uh, it's just incredible every year without fail. So without, and then at the end, after your chance for questions and answers from Daniel, We'll, as Grace said, we'll talk about a little bit about the, the program to have us all 
select a bird, a bird mascot. Uh, the United States has, has a bird, the eagle. Illinois has the cardinal. So why shouldn't Glencoe have its bird? So more on that later. So hang around till the end. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, all. I'm glad to be here. Nice to, I can't see you all, but I can see that there's over 83 participants, many of you sharing a screen. So very, uh, very excited to, to see that there's so much interest in, in birds. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and get this started. I have a lot of information to share. And as I normally do on these presentations, I have kind of like a little game with myself to see how much, how fast I can get through it all. Um, obviously it's a very, uh, as Hall alluded to, very complex uh, phenomena. And it's one that uh, humans across the world and through space and time have been able to witness. So just buckle up your seats. This is gonna be a, a, a fast whirlwind tour over the next 40 minutes or so. So starting, um, Starting here, I wanted to give everyone a sense of the scope of migration, not just within the United States, but on a hemispheric scale. Um, as you can see here, there's different colors associated with different types of birds, different suites of birds. But if you look closely, you'll notice that there's um, a, a definite convergence, convergence of many of these species just around the Chicago area. Uh, we are situated on a major migratory pathway. Um, certainly, um, there are other places in the United States um, along the coast. As you can see, the east and the west coast are major highways for migrating birds. Um, but also through the Midwest, we see um, birds congregating and concentrated around major bodies of water, such as the Mississippi River, the Illinois River, and on a smaller scale, um, the, the Des Plaines River and the Chicago River. And of course, um, our biggest asset of water, um, many would say, is, is Lake Michigan. And that certainly serves as a major conduit for many birds to pass through uh, the United States. As Hall uh, mentioned before, I'm, I, I don't know if I can fully explain um, the, the phenomena of bird migration in such a short amount of time with all of the um, information I wanna share with you, not only about the birds, but also things you can do to make um, the, the journeys of these species uh, a safer one. But I will say that migration has been happening since the beginning of, of, of land animals on Earth. Obviously, when, when the Earth was, uh, when, we, when we had Pangaea and all the continents were kind of bunched together, you still had significant land migration as those continents drifted apart um, and seas and oceans uh, uh, started separating them birds and other and other animals um, met the challenge. Some, I will say, uh, just because it's such a fascinating thing, that until very recently, until the 20th century, there was a lot of speculation about birds. And one of the major theories was that birds actually migrated to the moon. Um, on a clear night um, during this time of year, during the fall months, uh, you can still um, see the outlines, the silhouettes of hundreds of birds passing across the surface of the moon on a clear night with a full moon. Um, so you can see why early, earlier scientists would have, might have thought that birds could, could travel to the moon. Now, while that may sound far-fetched, I will say that there are, there are some species, um, including the red knot, which in the course of its lifetime um, migrates from the southern tip of South America all the way to the North Pole and back every single year. So over the course of the life of a red knot, they've actually uh, flown uh, the equivalent of to the moon and almost all the way back. And I wanted to put up this little animation here to give you a sense as to how birds are moving. So birds aren't all starting in the same spot. We see we've got a lot of birds that overwinter in the southern United States, Mexico, Central and South America, and they all start their migration at different times. Just because you are coming from further south does not necessarily mean that you're the first one to leave. Um, pay attention to the speed with which some of these dots are moving. Each of these dots represents a, a, a distinct species and several that were tracked using uh, telemetry uh, technology, uh, basically tags, uh, birds are tagged and, and tracked. And you can see that, you know, around 
August and September, you start seeing a major congregation again around the, the western edge of Lake Michigan. And then again, as we go into the winter, we see some of the species that call Chicago home are going uh, migrating as far south as Argentina and Patagonia. And just around this time is when we start seeing major movement in March and about where we are right now, May is really the heart of migration season. Now you might be wondering, I, I alluded to the fact that these birds are tagged and this is the, our understanding of bird migration and about animal migration in general has been revolutionized just in the last uh, decade or so. As tags get smaller and smaller, and you can see this one on the back of a bird, just a few, um, in some cases, as, as light as fractions of a single ounce, um, these tags uh, are placed on birds' backs. They do not restrict their movement. They do not weigh them down. They communicate with these towers, uh, these modus towers, which, as you can see, are not terribly uh, well, it's sophisticated equipment, but it doesn't necessarily look that high tech. Uh, this looks like the antenna I used to have on my parents' house when I was a little kid growing up. They've gotten much smaller now, but it's amazing the data that you can collect on these towers. And if a bird is flying nearby one of these towers and they're placed all over the United States and they're starting to be placed all over the continent uh, as well as South America, we can really start tracking these birds um, on, in a, in a, on a scale that we haven't been able to before. So it's important to remember that migration is risky. It's the most vulnerable period of a bird's life. Now, not all birds migrate, but the ones that do undergo a radical uh, transformation in, in front of their eyes in terms of the landscape that they're, that they're witnessing. Many of our species are coming from the Amazon rainforest or the, uh, the, the grasslands of South America and Argentina and Uruguay. They make their way over jungle, uh, forest, desert, and in many cases over open water, crossing the Gulf of Mexico, crossing uh, major swaths of the ocean. And when these birds arrive in a place like Chicago, you can imagine just how adaptable these birds have to be to survive in these environments. So I, you might be wondering why there's a picture of a cat and I'm sure many of you have heard, um, but feral cats or outdoor cats are one of, if not the biggest killer of birds, of migratory birds on an annual basis. I know that there's a lot of debate there's a lot of, uh, of, of strong emotions on the bird and on the cat side. But when we look at the scientific data, we know that outdoor cats are very, very capable hunters. And many of these birds, when they land in our backyards and in our parks, are vulnerable to, these, to cats and for that matter, to other animals. Um, they're flying thousands of miles. They're, they weigh less than a Kleenex in some cases, and they're tired. And so um, cats can take advantage of that uh, on their journeys. I have the picture of downtown Chicago to illustrate both the dangers of light pollution, which in a place like Chicago, with all of the ambient light pollution that we have, can disorient birds. Birds are drawn naturally to light. And when they find themselves in a place like downtown Chicago, especially at nighttime, they are uh, faced with a um, uh, a plethora of reflective surfaces and birds are easily disoriented by these reflective surfaces. They mistake glass uh, for a continuation of space and as you've probably heard before they can collide at very high speeds with windows either killing them instantly or, or, or severely, severely injuring them. Similarly in suburbia um, there's uh, there are no shortage of threats. Um, while tall buildings might not be as prevalent and there might not be as much light pollution, um, windows on residential buildings can be just as um, dangerous for birds. They will fly into, into the windows of your house. And, uh, and furthermore, as you look in this picture, and, and I'll show on, on some slides coming up, uh, what we plant in our yards can make our uh, communities either very attractive and beneficial for birds or somewhat of a trap. 
So I just wanted to briefly touch on some of these spectacular birds um, that pass through our region. Some that you might have seen before, others that you might never have known existed. And I'm, I'm showing you these specific birds just to kind of give you a sense of to the, both the diversity of birds, like Hall alluded to earlier, but also just the, um, the diversity in species, but also the diversity in appearance and size and shape. And here, as you can see, color. So I, I love telling the story about one of my ecological mentors, uh, who's very highly regarded prairie restoration expert, who's spoken all over the country and traveled the world, um, seeing some of some restoration projects up close and, and meeting people that are doing work on the ground. And he told me a story about uh, when he was paddling in the Amazon rainforest and they had an indigenous guide who was leading them down uh, the Amazon River. And uh, my mentor asked the guide what the most beautiful bird in the entire Amazon rainforest was. And he thought long and hard about it and was kind of saying like, give me a second to think about that. And after a couple of seconds, he heard the call of a bird. He said, that's the bird, that's the bird. And he pointed up to a tree, he looked up, through his binoculars, and my mentor was shocked to find that the scarlet tanager was the bird identified by that Amazonian tour guide as the most beautiful bird in the entire rainforest. And I think that that's a really important message to deliver home because I think a lot of us tend to think about nature as being this kind of like pristine wilderness that people are not a part of, um, where humans, um, uh, fingerprints on the landscape are not readily seen. However, in a place like Chicago that has been so thoroughly transformed over the last 200 years, we still have species like the scarlet tanager that call our region home, either home or a major stopping point along its annual migration. And so I think a lot of folks, myself included, before I, I really got uh, involved in conservation work is we tend to devalue, I think a lot of the nature that we have in our region, or we tend to think of it as, um, as, as compromised in some way. But as I think migration teaches us, the birds are gonna come. They are following ancient migration routes that are thousands and thousands of years old. So whether or not there's a skyscraper, an, a giant metropolis, a cornfield, or a pristine wilderness, um, the birds will come in, into these areas. So the scarlet tanager and the indigo bunting, um, whose call I just heard for the first time this week, the indigo bunting, um, haven't heard the scarlet tanager yet, shows you, uh, I think, two opposite ends of the color spectrum. In blue being one of the most rare colors in nature. Um, and a fun fact, even though it's called the indigo bunting, the only reason that it appears blue to us is uh, based on the way that light uh, reflects off of the bird's feathers, um, they they trick our eyes into seeing it as blue. But in reality, this bird is actually more of a more of a drabish brown color. The common nighthawk is um, a beautiful bird. It's one of the night jars, which are these very quickly declining birds that are aerial insectivores. So these birds hunt insects directly in, in midair. And uh, the, name, the name common nighthawk tends to uh, denote its, uh, its commonness, I think, on the landscape. But I will say that this species is severely in decline. The best place, the easiest place, the most common place that I see a common nighthawk is at night games at Wrigley Field um, with all of the rooftops nearby. This is a species that nests on, on roofs. Um, on flat roofs in Chicago. I hear them um, where, from where I live in the Hummel Park neighborhood, I hear them uh, almost every night during the summer months. And you can catch them um, at a place like Wrigley Field due to the, the, the bright lights that are on the field. Insects get attracted to those lights and the common nighthawks follow closely behind trying to hunt them in midair. And the kestrel, which is, one, is the, the smallest falcon species that we have just a stunningly beautiful bird um, that will hover above many of our region's grasslands and hunt small rodents out of our out of our local prairies. 
the cedar waxwing, which is probably, in my opinion, the most underappreciated uh, bird in North America. Just stunning beauty. And this is a species that uh, that will migrate to our region from uh, just a little further south in the United States. This one actually will call the Chicago region home, um, along with the common nighthawk, the kestrel, and the uh, the indigo bunting. All the species that I've shown will call will call the Chicago region home. And the cedar waxwing, if you've never experienced it before, it's a beautiful sight to see the courtship rituals between the males and females. Whereas you can see in this photo, they will pass a small berry of a tree back and forth to one another um as as a as as a you know ancient courtship ritual that they've uh developed and can't talk about migratory birds without warblers they're the flying jewels of the animal world they come in all kinds of colors they live in all kinds of habitats uh including some of the most pristine wilderness areas you can imagine and when they come through the chicago area it really gets all the birders excited um, you can see just some of the variety here. Um, again, many of these species are, uh, are severely in decline, uh, so they're, they're relatively rare. But during migration, on the right day, in the right place, you can be treated to uh, a feast of warblers. In some cases, on a good day, you could get over 10 species of warblers in a, in a, in a single preserve. And it's really one that I think discourages a lot of new birders because there's a lot of variation in how they look. The males, all the all the birds that you're seeing seen here are males, brightly colored males that are trying to attract a mate. The females generally are more; uh, they're not as colorful since they're they don't have to. Uh, they're not the ones that have to attract the mate. They get to sit back and and let the guys kind of try to try to impress them. But the females, no doubt, beautiful in their own right. Um, so right now we're we're kind of right at the cusp of of warbler season. The first warblers have already moved through. And we're getting ready for the pulse of, of, of warblers, which really kicks off the kind of the, the heart of migration season. And I know folks were wondering, like, where are the best places to see migratory birds? This by no means is an exhaustive list, and I wanted to keep it, you know, reasonably distanced from Glencoe, where you all are. Um, but like I just said, birds, you know, it's hard to predict what site is going to be super birdy in any particular day. There are things like uh, wind patterns that a lot of people will follow. There are websites that show um, where uh, birds are migrating. And I actually, um, I'm realizing that I, I did not put this slide together and I'm, I'm regretting it already. There are websites where, bir where, where birders have learned as Doppler technology has improved there are actually ways that you can observe and see huge concentrations of migratory birds flying, taking off from their roost every single night during migration. And you can differentiate it from uh, storm clouds nearby. And so when we know that we're getting strong southerly winds, um, we know that there's going to be an influx of new migrants. Um, these species are flying at nighttime and they take advantage of of the wind uh, to make their journeys uh, easier. So I think the general rule of thumb to remember with migration is that the closer you are to the shores of Lake Michigan, the, 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 more, in, the more important that habitat becomes and the greater likelihood that you'll see interesting migratory birds. That being said, everywhere that you see green on this map and even places like downtown Chicago, uh, where Audubon has its offices, we haven't been there in a while, but during migration season, we're always hearing and seeing um, the rarest of the rare birds passing right through uh, Millennium Park. So these sites that I've called out are ones that are all very relatively close or right on the lakefront. And um, these are places where uh, on a good day, you're likely to find a good diversity of species. So. Uh, Montrose Point Bird Sanctuary is probably the most famous one. The point, uh, the magic hedge, you might have heard it referred to. And basically, this is this habitat is right on Lake Michigan. And so if we had never built the city of Chicago, if uh, or if Chicago had been built and we had simply conserved more green space right on the lakefront, there would be several places that have the allure and the mystique that Montrose Point Bird Sanctuary has. 
So it's not necessarily that the habitat is super high quality or that it's um, or, or that there's anything particularly special about it. I mean, it's a, it's a postage size stamp um, of a preserve. It's very small, but uh, anyone who's been there sees the outsized importance of a place like this when it's right on the water. And as I mentioned before, these birds are following the western shores of Lake Michigan. They're also congregating down at the Indiana Dunes on the southern rim of Lake Michigan. This is a major launching point for birds where some will either follow the western edge of Lake Michigan Others will follow the eastern edge and others will fly directly over open water for large stretches. Laba Woods is one that I called out that is further inland. This one is a few miles inland, uh, but for whatever reason, maybe it's because there's so many birders, uh, there's so many people at that site that have been checking out birds over the years um, that, uh, that it also has an outsized importance for migratory birds. On a particular day, you might have an easterly wind blowing off Lake Michigan. That might drive the birds further inland uh, along the um, other major migratory routes that I mentioned before, the Des Plaines River and the Chicago River. So any of these places are good, but I'll talk a little bit about eBird later. And eBird is a great resource to check in on places that are seeing lots of migratory birds. So I also wanted to show you, just because I love these animations, as our technology about bird migration increases, I love seeing animations like this. So this is tracking the migration of the ruby-throated hummingbird, which is the only hummingbird species that we have that calls the, the Chicago region home. Last week, there, was, there were sightings of an ultra-rare bird, the broad-billed hummingbird, which is normally uh, found in Texas, Arizona, and Mexico. And for whatever reason, one of those birds was uh, was uh, kind of got roped into taking a long migration all the way to Chicago where it was found at Laba Woods. And I'm going to play this again. I want you to see how much this species kind of spreads through the Midwest and through the Chicago region. And, and these birds, while it might not appear so much on this, do call the region home. So this is what we would consider a long bird migrant. This, this bird's coming from Guatemala, Central America, all the way to the Chicago region and even further north. Here's another species, the palm warbler, again, one of our one of those flying jewels. This is a shorter distance migrant that spends most that spend its, spends its winter in Florida for the most part. But you can see just that dark purple color, especially in the springtime, just how important the Chicago region is and just how big of a concentration, the relative abundance that we're seeing of this bird really highlights the importance. And you see that that abundance is not just concentrated right on the lake. Um, that, uh, that, that abundance, uh, almost all of Northeastern Illinois is, is lit up really dark. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, these birds are, uh, are spending their winters in a vastly different landscape. The, the rainforest in some cases, and when they land in our communities, they're faced with tiny parcels of land from which they need to stay safe from predators, recharge their batteries, and find food. And so I don't want to get everyone depressed, but I do want everyone, I do, I do want everyone to uh, understand the, uh, you know, the serious nature of which these birds are uh, declining and, and the challenges that they're facing. So uh, you might have seen, you know, these, these slides were pulled together before the, the report came out, but there was the 3 billion birds report that came out that said that Compared to the 1970s, there are 3 billion fewer birds um, in the skies uh, from ver for various reasons, from habitat destruction to feral cats to bird coll uh, to collisions with buildings and many other, um, and many other reasons. But uh, as a whole, neotropical migratory songbirds, many of which are, are species that we've, we've been looking at, are declining. So the cerulean warbler, for instance, 74% decline over the last 50 years. The yellow-billed cuckoo, 52%. The rose-breasted grosbeak, another common migrant through our region, 35% decrease. And it's easy to see why, as I go through these slides, why those, um, why those numbers are going down. So here's housing density in 1940, 1980, 2010, 
and 2030. And you can just see, I'll go back a little bit. You can see as that red grows, that's density of people, right? Now, density of people isn't the only thing that's hurting these birds. It's conversion to agriculture. So as we convert in Illinois, we've we converted most of our uh, prairies to agriculture uh, over 100 years ago. And in many, ca in many cases, the, the, uh, the Great Plains are where we're seeing the, the, the largest land conversions happening right now. And just between 2010 and 2020 in the Great Plains, over 10 million acres of prairie um, were converted. So not only from the cities, but also from agriculture, birds are finding the landscape to be less and less hospitable and there's less and less connectivity between quality habitats for them. So we've gone from uh, this contiguous landscape of, of diversity of native plants, and we now uh, have about 54% of the US now in this like urban suburban matrix, and the vast majority of plants that are, are found in these communities are non-native. And why is that important? Because native plants are better for birds. So this is a, a program of, of Audubon. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the importance of native plants for birds and then give you some resources um, in which you can learn about how making some, even some small changes uh, to your yards at home, uh, to your parks, um, to even to your balconies uh, can, can result in a brighter future for birds. So um, there are four native plant food groups for birds. And I think three of them are fairly straightforward. Many people know about them. Maybe nectar is a little bit of a surprise, but we'll, we'll talk about that. But the fourth food group, which is arguably the most important, well, we've got, uh, I'll, I'll delay the gratification a little bit. We see our berries, our nuts, and our nectar. The fourth food group, arguably the most important, insects specifically caterpillars. Young caterpillars survive almost exclusively on caterpillars from the time that they're born to the time that they leave the nest. They require caterpillars. And these are caterpillars that are adapted and have evolved with native species. So if you really want to save birds, we have to find ways to produce more caterpillars. It's almost, it's, it's pretty much as simple as that. And how do we do this? How do we encourage more caterpillars? Uh, there's a very famous book that I've got up here, Bringing Nature Home, it's by Doug Tallamy. Very uh, influential book that really highlights the importance of native plants in our communities. Um, so to give you a, a sense of the disparity between native and non-native species, an oak tree upon which we have dozens of species in, in the United States. Uh, your average oak tree in the Eastern United States will, can, uh, oaks, I should, I should say it this way, oaks across the United States can support almost 600 different species of caterpillars, either butterfly caterpillars or moth caterpillars. Um, meanwhile, a ginkgo tree, which, uh, is a popular street tree and, and it's been, you know, it's been planted here for, for decades, if not centuries, uh, which is, uh, is sometimes heralded as being pest free, um, can only support five species of caterpillars. So you're really talking about uh, a major order of magnitude that, that oaks uh, are, are, are uh, they're, they're more important on, on, on a scale of, of many, many times. And so insects, uh, as I mentioned before, are, have co-evolved with our native plants. And so 90% of insects that are plant eaters are, can only eat the plants with which they co-evolve. Co I mean, this is an amazing statistic. And I think the, the most uh, common example that we see of this are monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies, their relationship to milkweed plants, the only thing that their caterpillars can eat and uh, so without milkweeds, we don't have monarchs. Similarly, without caterpillars uh, and native plants, we won't have birds. I wanna show cool, a couple of cool examples, local examples of this interaction. So here we have the spice bush swallowtail butterfly with its uh, almost cartoonish looking uh, caterpillar on the left. Uh, as you can see, it's got uh, a very strong uh, resemblance to uh, a snake or, or an animal, you definitely see those eyes and it definitely discourages um, 
um, bird predators. And all the way on the right, you can see the berries of the spice bush uh, shrub, which is uh, a super important food source for birds in that their fruit is very high in lipids. And lipids are a kind of fat that is found in, in these berries. And it's like the equivalent of eating like a complete protein, like quinoa, like very healthy meal compared to what you would find on the berry of like a buckthorn or a honeysuckle. Um, this we can equate more with like junk food. It'll, it'll, it'll keep you alive when you're struggling, but it's not going to let you perform at your maximum. Another example is the, the giant swallowtail butterfly and the wafer ash shrub on the right. And it's, it, and it's caterpillar on the left, which is literally meant to resemble a piece of bird poop. Um, birds don't like eating bird poop. So this uh, caterpillar disguises itself by appearing as such. And so I mentioned the oaks, but willows, cherries, birch, there's, there are many, many options for native species to plant. And I've just got the, the trees listed here. Shrubs are um, in, in, many, in many ways comparable to these trees. Uh, many, uh, many host insects. Uh, it serves as a host plant for many of those insects that I just showed. So I mentioned that, you know, baby birds eat predominantly caterpillars. And to put that into context, uh, based on a, on a study that happened on chickadees, they found that a single baby bird needed over 9,000 caterpillars, uh, needed to eat 9,000 caterpillars from the moment it hatched to the time it fledged and left the nest. So that's a lot of caterpillars. And it might surprise you uh, even to know that birds, that there are this many caterpillars in our communities already. Um, but it's simply not enough right now. We don't have enough native plants in the landscape because we know that over 80% all the plants in our communities are non-native species. So again, just want to highlight this disparity. Almost 600 species of caterpillars compared to five. So in many ways, a world without insects is a world without birds. I'm going to go quickly through the rest of these food groups here. Uh, fruits. That's the spice bush again, as I mentioned, high in lipids, really good for birds. The problem with berries is that they're only accessible to many of the larger birds. So a small bird like a warbler simply cannot swallow the fruit of this eastern wahoo, which is one of the more stunning uh, native shrub species that we have. Just beautiful fall color, uh, not only on its foliage, but as you can see here on its, on its fruits. And here's another close-up of the spice bush, one of the favorites smells delicious, the leaves smell delicious, the stems smell delicious, and the birds love it. The third food group is nectar. That might be a surprise to some folks. That's mostly through hummingbirds. And so hummingbirds, uh, you might wonder why all most hummingbird feeders you see are bright red. And that's because hummingbirds are very perceptive of the color red. It's a color that insects actually cannot perceive very well. So when you see a lot of red flowers, there's a good chance if it hasn't been, uh, if it's not a horticultural plant that has been bred for certain characteristics, if it's a, if it's a true native species uh, and it's red, chances are it's pollinated by hummingbirds. And here's one hummingbird pollinating a cardinal flower, one of our native uh, wetland plants. Jewelweed, jewelweed is another uh, native species that the hummingbirds love. This one is a a very common species that you'll find in our woodlands, as well as wild columbine, something that does well, very well in the home garden, as well as out in nature. Royal catchfly, this one is actually a listed species in Illinois, but I've got some planted in my front yard. And uh, believe it or not, in Chicago, I have seen hummingbirds visit that catchfly. And the food group, nuts and seeds, probably what we think of first when we think about uh, bird food. And these nuts, again, similarly, very big and only edible to a few large birds. But the role that birds like blue jays play in the dispersal of oak uh, acorns and basically planting the next generation of oaks is, is a, a, a super important ecological role and function that this bird plays. Here's the hazelnut, once probably the most common shrub in the state of Illinois. Now, 
Uh, you're hard pressed to find it uh, outside of very high quality habitats. And this is one that uh, some might know as filbert. And yes, it's the, it's, the, it's the nut that Nutella is created from. So not many folks know that, but the hazelnut is one of the most prized nuts out in, in, the, in the wilds of the Chicago wilderness. And seeds, as we see here on the purple coneflower, one of the more common native species that we see planted out in the landscape. Things like goldfinches really appreciate that. As well as things like asters and goldenrods. A lot of people don't realize that these tiny, tiny seeds that these species create um, are, the, are the food sources that small birds like those warblers can eat in big numbers and are, nutritious, uh, uh, and are a very nutritious food source for them. So things like white-throated sparrow, a winter resident of ours in the, in the Chicago area, um, really rely on seeds. So and when you grow these seeds in your yard uh, over the winter, if you've got native species growing, make sure to leave those plants up. Don't trim them back because those seeds are, are what sustain a lot of our winter birds. And so I just wanted to drive home the, um, the importance of what we're doing, the urgency with which we need to do it because of climate change. So here's the, here's the, what you're seeing here, another animation, surprise, surprise, you know how much I love animations at this point. What we're seeing uh, in yellow is the rank, current range of the bobolink, which is one of our iconic grassland bird species. Um, you're seeing on the left, there are three climate change scenarios that this animation is showing. So it's, it's progressing through the current scenario where we are right now. If we, if the, the globe heats up one and a half degrees Celsius, the second scenario is two degrees Celsius, and the third scenario, almost like doomsday scenarios, is a three degrees Celsius. Everything you're seeing in red is range that it's projected to lose. Everything you're seeing in blue is range that you're, that it's projected to gain. So you might think, oh, well, you know, these bobolink will just move further north into Canada and, and things will be okay. But when you think about the fact that this bird is a grassland species that needs large open grasslands to breed in, when it gets to Canada, it's gonna be faced with the boreal forest, the large, one of the largest swaths of forest in the world. And there's not gonna be grassland waiting for that species there. So we, we have to make our landscape more hospitable to birds as soon as possible so that they can start adapting to the changes that are coming their way from the climate perspective. So a lot of species, not just the bobolink, are facing similar pressures um, as these, which underscores the importance for making changes, um, not, not just on, uh, in our backyards, uh, but in our communities, in our cities, in our states, and nationally and internationally. So what can you do? And I know I've just got a couple minutes. I'm just gonna show you, I'm gonna blow through some of these slides. Um, as you can see, I'm losing my race with myself to get you all this information. Uh, but this is all readily available on the, the, uh, the uh, resources that I'm gonna share with you. An important thing, if you're gonna plant native plants in your yard, don't try to do it all in one year. Take small chunks of, 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 of your yard every year and make a transformation. And just know that there are multiple layers, different birds, uh, look for food in different layers of habitat. So some birds spend most of their time in the canopy, gleaning insects off of the branches of trees. Others like the shrub layer and the small tree layer. Others are, um, are, are more dependent on maybe uh, catching insects out of midair and others are searching through the leaf layer on the ground for insects to eat. And uh, you know, one, just a public uh, service announcement, um, raking is, is um, in many ways a, a, a destructive act. I don't, I don't mean to be melodramatic, but um, a lot of moth caterpillars, uh, of which we've already highlighted the importance of, um, spend their winters um, in our leaf litter. So the less, you, the less you rake, the more likelihood that some of these moths will survive the winter and survive to their next, to the adult stage, where they'll be uh, a, hopefully a tasty uh, treat for a, for a migratory bird. Obviously cutting down on pesticide use uh, will improve conditions for birds because as we know, uh, birds need insects. And water, uh, providing water sources in your yard is hugely important. Just like humans, birds need to drink water. 
Uh, they like to keep, keep themselves clean. So putting a bird bath in your yard is um, in many ways a, a super helpful thing you can do. That's, that's pretty, pretty straightforward and easy. Even creating uh, brush piles. These are all things that help bird brush piles provide uh, protection from predators um, and, and give, give birds a chance to rest. Like the dark-eyed junco, very, very common in, in brush piles. And standing dead cavities. Uh, dead tree cavities are amazing, not only for tree swallows, but eastern bluebirds as well. Two beautiful, beautiful bird species that is not, it's not too far-fetched to think that uh, a, a dead tree snag in Glencoe could attract uh, some of these birds. So I just want to say before I show you some native plants, I want you to be aware of native ours. So I know that there's a lot of growing interest in native plants, and there are a lot of nurseries that, um, that sell native plants. However, they're not all created equally. Uh, native ours are native species that have been cultivated. They're cultivars of native species. And so um, these plants have been bred to display certain characteristics. It might be a larger flower. It might be a different flower color. But in short, as we, just, as we talked about earlier, insects co-evolved with native plants. So when you fundamentally change the, the, the shape or the color or the size of a flower or a leaf, that could have negative impacts on the insects that depend on them. So the easiest way to tell when, when you're seeing a native R is when you see kind of like a designer name uh, after its scientific name. So here we have Aquilegia canadensis, the wild columbine, pink lanterns. That should set off an alarm that this plant has been bred. This is a trademark name. Similarly with our swamp milkweed here, Asclepius incarnata, ice ballet. Here on the right, you can see Asclepius incarnata and Asclepius syriaca. There's no designer name after that. There's a good chance that's not a native R. So I would encourage you all to do a little bit of work uh, to differentiate between the two. Now I'm gonna end on this and I'm gonna go through it kind of fast. The good thing is this is a web-based, tool that you can explore and peruse on your own time. So this is a, a native plants database that Audubon developed that you can simply uh, put in your zip code and it will generate. And, and I will tell you this, if you don't want to get emails from Audubon, you don't have to put in your email address. All you have to do is put in your zip code and it will work. So uh, if, you're, if you want to receive the Audubon emails, please, by all means, put in your email. But I know folks get a lot of uh, a lot of stuff in their in their inboxes. So when you search your zip code, what you'll see is a list of native species that are appropriate to your area. Um, you'll get information on the species, on the plant species, and you'll also get information on what birds might be attracted to those plants. You'll also be able to search based on annuals or perennials, grasses, shrubs, trees, vines, um, to 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 uh, to get more detailed information on, on a particular species you're looking for. You can also look for the plant resources, the one, the four food groups that we just went over. Um, you can look, you can search for specific types of birds. And then it also gives you local resources that you can reach out to, Audubon, local Audubon societies and native plant societies that you can reach out to for help uh, with choosing native plants for your yard as well as a list of nurseries and native plant sales that are happening near you. A couple of other good resources uh, is the Illinois Native Plant Society website. This is, their, uh, this is their URL. They're an excellent resource for finding uh, native plants uh, in your community. And they have, web, they have uh, nurseries and plant sales happening across the state. So I'll skip over that again. Um, we've talked about bird friendliness. Um, bird friendliness is climate friendliness. Native plants sequester more carbon um, and they create a brighter, brighter future for birds. And I'll end on this, just a couple of resources for folks because I know I didn't spend time helping you identify birds. That'll be in the June program with uh, Refugio, my colleague. But the Merlin app is an amazing app uh, for, for beginners. Um, you literally, as you can see on the bottom left here, you go through, you answer a series of questions about the bird you saw, and it'll hone in on your GPS coordinates, and it will give you um, a list of birds that you're likely to see. And this is this corresponds with eBird, which is an online database of, of, of community scientists everywhere across the world that are making observations of birds, logging it on eBird, 
It's connected with this Merlin app and will give you the likeliest birds that you're seeing in your area. So I would highly recommend if you're, first, if you're frequently frustrated with not being able to uh, identify those birds at your, at your feeders or just when you're out and about, uh, take out your smartphone and, uh, and use the Merlin app. It's a good one iNaturalist and Seek, uh, both iNaturalist products are also good ones. They actually have a feature where you can take a picture of plants, uh, insects, birds, and there's a, uh, it has the capability to help identify your plant just from the photo itself. So that's a really cool one too. And here is the uh, URL for the Plants for Birds program. That's where you'll find that, uh, that database. I encourage you to please um, check it out, peruse the website, get connected to other resources, and start making a difference in your backyard. It's never too early to start. So with that, there's my email. If anyone has questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out. It's just daniel.suarez at audubon.org. And thank you for coming along with me on that whirlwind, uh, whirlwind tour through the world of birds and plants. I hope, uh, I hope you all learned something. And thanks again for having me. Thanks so much, Mr. Torres. That was your passion for this is it comes through loud and clear and um the you're right those video links are amazing so thank you thank you so much um so interesting um i i just want to mention um somebody asked on, on the chat just now um if um it, the recording will be available to us and yes it will be available to to anyone who registered for the program or anyone who just visits the, the glencoe public library's youtube channel um, if you need help finding it, just give me a, an email. Um, all right, I've, we've got a couple of questions. So um, uh, here's a comment from someone who says um, uh, that Shelton Park in Glencoe, after a big night on Birdcast, has a lot of warblers. Um, I, do, can you, do you have anything to say about that? Um, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for mentioning BirdCast. That's the, that's the um, online tool where you can go and look at the radar images and folks are constantly posting on there saying like in Chicago area, we're poised to have a really big day. And this is just something that's happened in the last couple of years. When I started at Audubon seven years ago, we were not looking at BirdCast. And now it's almost like getting a weather report if I'm on Twitter or on Instagram. Uh, I see birders that are that are signing the alarms that tomorrow is going to be a great day. Get out there, check out birds, go to your local patch. And that's, I think it just makes birding way more accessible for folks. They don't have to feel like they have to travel to Yellowstone or uh, or something to see large concentrations of, of, of diverse bird species. Great, thank you, Birdcast. Um, Terry would like to know, um, how do pet birds like finches and parrots that have been released into the into the wild affect other native birds, if, if at all? You know, in, in our area, in the Chicago area, we haven't seen um, that big of issues. I think a lot of these um, problems are magnified, especially like on islands. So like in places like Hawaii, where, you, where there's, a lot of endemic species of birds that only live on that one island. Um, bringing in other species um, could disrupt the, you know, the food chain, the distribution of resources. But in our region, you know, we have birds like the like the green the green parakeets that are in the Chicago area. Um, they will build nests on on the highway overpasses. They're on the bridge going on the Skyway going into Indiana. They recently, a couple of years ago, removed a huge colony of those birds. I have a I have a cousin that lives over by Midway Airport and has them nesting in his in his uh, evergreen tree in the backyard. But we haven't really seen any negative impacts on other bird species. Um, there might be issues that are magnified if you're talking about the introduction of a predator um, into a particular habitat, but it's not really as uh, cut and dry as the impacts that non-native plant species can have on plant communities. Okay, super, thank you. Um, Melissa asks, which shrubs are especially beneficial? And she says, it's a wonderful program. You mentioned spicebush. Uh, do you have- I mentioned others? spicebush. Uh, the Eastern Wahoo uh, is another one I mentioned. Um, the, the ones where you can kind of choose the most from, uh, viburnums and dogwoods are two big uh, plant uh, genera that have lots of species within them. So 
uh, from the dogwoods, there's red osier dogwood, gray dogwood, flowering dogwood, pagoda dogwood, and, and there's a huge variety on the viburnum side as well. Some of them shrubbier, multi-trunked, uh, small shrubs, others more like small tree growth. So there's really a lot of options for people to choose from. And I think there are, you know, th there are a lot of nurseries that specialize in, in particular shrub species. So um, basically, if you're planting a native shrub, you're making a difference. So um, there's not as much clear data on the shrubs as there are with the trees, like the oaks are by far, in a, in a way, the number one species. We don't quite have that level of detail with the, the shrubs yet, but safe to say the dogwoods, the viburnums are great places to start, um, as well as those things mentioned before, hazelnut, spicebush, wahoo. Is that Wahoo like spelled like the fish? W A H O O? Or? Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks. Terrific. Um, Pat asks, do meal live mealworms help supplement the lack of caterpillars? Probably not, because just because of that sheer number of of caterpillars, you know, the the density of nutrients that they contain. The fact that a single bird needs 9,000 of those caterpillars to get from, uh, from, from, from hatching to fledging. Um, mealworms probably, you know, they might help sustain a bird for a short period of time during migration, but probably are not being taken from the bird to its young in the nest. Um, they're, they're, they're usually pretty particular about what they're feeding their birds and they know that they need caterpillars. Okay, it's a very nice idea though. Um, yeah. And everything helps. I don't want to discourage you from doing that, but yeah, I suppose anything you can do to other things that you can do to try to um, sustain the adult birds also helps, like providing extra water and shelter and such. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, Eric would like to know um, how do birds know when it's time to migrate? You know, that's a good question, and we don't entirely know the answer to that. I mean, there are certainly um, certainly a couple of key things. So like the, the length of the day is something that birds hone in on. So as days get longer or shorter, um, there, there are clues that the birds need to start moving. Um, there are things like uh, certain alignments of, of stars. There's been, um, there's been studies done uh, showing that birds seem to be able to kind of hone in on the Earth's magnetic field. And so, uh, once once they decide that they're going to start migrating and they get up into the sky, there have been studies where a bird that will be normally found in California um, that migrates down to Mexico will get taken over to the eastern United States, and uh, and and those birds have been able to find their wintering patch in Mexico, whether they started in California or in in Maine, for instance. So. Um, you know, when, when birds know when it's time to migrate is kind of a question of like the, the length of the day and just the position of the, the sun and the stars on the horizon. But then also once, they're, once they start migrating, they, they tune themselves into following the contours of water and then also uh, Earth's magnetic field. It's, but it's, it's not something that has been scientifically, you know, fully, fully proven and shown. So there's still a little bit of speculation. We're still learning more about that. Thank you. Uh, Jeff says, uh, how do you think the broad-billed hummingbird arrived in Chicago? You know, that's, that's the a one good that was question. way out of its range. <laughs> right. yeah, way out of its range and had birders like jumping all over each other to try to get photos of it. Um, storms, uh, strong storms usually can uh, either knock birds off course or can uh, or can bring groups of birds together in ways that they wouldn't have been. So sometimes as birds are uh, moving through an area and there's a major storm system, they might get blown off course. And over time, you know, birds don't necessarily migrate in, 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 species, in species by species. So you don't see a, a huge uh, flock of Baltimore Orioles flying together and you don't see a big flock of Cerulean Warblers flying together. They're all kind of jumbled together. Um, so, most likely, uh, that hum that broad-billed hummingbird got jumbled up with some birds, maybe around the storm, and somehow, for some reason, just kept going. It's 
these these cases are documented all the time where you have these these kind of long distance migrants that are totally out of their elements out of their normal uh, range and I think most of the time it's just speculation as to how how that bird ended up there but it's amazing nonetheless a bird that doesn't really migrate at all uh, took it upon itself to migrate you know almost 2,000 miles thanks Terry Alex asks Bird feeders, good or not so good? Bird feeders are good. Bird feeders are good. So um, again, I don't want to, like like you said, Grace, like it's important to maintain the health of the adult birds too. So uh, birds, the birds, uh, the adult birds might not necessarily be eating the caterpillars. They're looking more for things like seeds and things like that. So certainly bird feeders are help supplement uh, that. That being said, not all birds, uh, migrating birds will be attracted to your feeders. Um, you probably, if you, if you have bird feeders, you probably have like a list of, uh, you know, the common, the usual suspects that you'll find at the feeder and you won't really see maybe the warblers quite so much. Um, also, there's like some weird social patterns around bird feeders where like, you know, if you've got a, a bully of a house sparrow or a, a, a finch or something in your yard, they might chase away some of the migratory birds. So they might not necessarily be uh, a make or break kind of a thing for migratory birds. For resident birds, definitely they make a difference. And then I would say like, if you have bird feeders and you don't have native plants, just take that next step, supplement your yard with some native plants and you're providing a wider range of diversity of, of food sources for birds. Relatedly, Joel asks, can you buy milkweed or do you have to grow your own? Oh, you can, well, you can do both. Uh, you can buy milkweed for sure. There are many species of milkweed in the Chicago region. So there are probably close to about a dozen species of milkweed that are native to Chicago, some of which are very restricted to a particular habitat. Uh, but that, that diversity might surprise some people. Um, the most common ones that you'll find in a nursery are the butterfly, the orange butterfly weed, um, the uh, swamp milkweed, um, those are probably the two most common ones, and they're readily available in nurseries. And if you uh, if you buy if you buy your own uh, milkweed, you can collect those seeds. You could spread those seeds and grow new ones from it. Um, I won't advocate for you to go to preserves and and take seeds to grow grow at home, but there's enough common milkweed that grows on the side of the roads, in uh, alleys, in cracks in the sidewalk. And if you collect those seeds and plant them in your yard, there's a good chance that you might be able to grow some, some milkweed from it. It just might take a couple of years. Great, another bird, uh, bird feeder question. What are the best kinds of seeds for feeders and what about suet? You know, there's not necessarily a, a, a single answer for that. Different birds will prefer different kinds of seeds. So, uh, you know, the suet is very popular with a lot of the larger birds and the, the woodpeckers. Um, some of the finches might be drawn to the to the smaller seeds and the thistle seeds and things like that. So, I mean, I think if you're if you're finding that you're getting bored of the birds that you're seeing at your feeder, you might try to switch up the type of food you're putting out, and uh, you know, observe and take notes on what seems to be attracted to what. I mean, on the side of the bags, you'll usually see some cookie cutter language about the types of birds that it'll it'll attract. Uh, but there's a lot of nuance and there's things like you know oranges that you can put out that will attract orioles and things of that nature so there's there's a lot of different types of birds you can attract and so i would say just experiment and finally i'm going to take oops I, we have two two more questions um and then then sure. we're gonna then we're gonna stop um one more bird reader question uh, or birdhouse question sorry how how far should a birdhouse be placed from a feeder uh, should a birdhouse be placed from a feeder? Um, I would, I mean, I guess it depends on the size of your yard. I mean, the more, the more distance you could put between the birdhouse and the feeder, the, the, the less competition there might be for, uh, for taking occupancy in that birdhouse. So, you know, without necessarily knowing all of the details about your particular yard, I would say if you can separate them, uh, to do so because, uh, if there are many birds attracted to your feeder and it's right next to a birdhouse, you might find that a bird that's trying to successfully nest in your in your birdhouse might face a series of disruptions and, and unexpected visitors and aggressive visitors that might 
either cause it to abandon the nest or to just uh, not really be successful in, in rearing. Because there's a lot of birds that, that are pretty aggressive and they'll, they'll try to kick out the residents or try to hurt the, the baby birds that are inside. Great, thank you. And one last question from Stephen who wants to know, what can we do about house sparrows? You know, I'm afraid there's not that much we can do. Um, house sparrows have been here for a long time now, and they're one of the most common birds in the United States. And to get rid of them would be, I think, more, uh, more re would require more resources than we have uh, to deal with the problem. Certainly, I know I see it all the time in Chicago. Uh, I, I see, I get heartbroken sometimes when I see a beautiful warbler or this other rare bird during migration season only to see a house sparrow like rush right up to it and chase it away. Um, you know, that annoys me. I'm, I'm, I'm bothered by that. At the same time, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to look at the birds through the lens of, of their presence on a global scale. So while in the United States, we kind of are fed up with house sparrows and we, we want to get rid of them. Um, in Europe, across their range, their native range, where they're from, they're actually a declining species, severely so. Um, and they're a species that uh, is, is being considered to be listed on a threatened or endangered basis in Europe. So just because it's common here doesn't mean it's common everywhere. And, and I think that there's, um, I think, something to learn uh, from that. House sparrows, we're not, I don't think, going to be getting rid of them anytime soon unless some major uh, sickness, uh, disease goes through their through their population. They're likely here to stay. I think for me, the best hope is that over time they uh, develop less. Uh, well, they they don't have as much of an advantage as they had now over a lot of our urban birds. Some of our native species might catch up to them and become more adaptable and flexible and better at living in our cities. Uh, but for now, the the house sparrows uh, have the upper hand. Uh, maybe. Uh, Maybe, maybe we'll see them decrease over time, but I don't think we'll be getting rid of them anytime soon. Okay, you know what, the, do you, can you tolerate two or three more questions? A few others came in. Sure. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Ron wants to know, are we seeing more cowbirds? Yes, I think we are seeing more cowbirds. And, and cowbirds, uh, for folks that don't know, this is a parasitic uh, bird. So in, in bird world, this means that the female cowbirds do not build a nest they will lay their eggs in the nest of another bird. And when that mm -hmm. bird hatches, it generally is bigger and grows faster than the other birds in, of, uh, than the other birds that are in the nest along with it. And birds have this biological response where the mother bird will feed the bird, the, the chick that is the biggest and that looks the healthiest, even if it's not its own. Uh, so, Sometimes you'll see these pictures of a baby cowbird that's twice the size of another bird just standing on top of it, where the mother bird is even smaller than the baby cowbird and is <laughs> feeding it food. Uh, so this is like, you know, birds, a lot of the, the chicks that, that hatch don't make it to full adulthood. And so they have to put their resources into the birds that they think are going to make it and carry on their, their genetics. Um, and so the, the cowbirds are, um, are increasing because they like edge habitats. They like... Uh, they like these fragmented habitats. So it's interesting because these birds, cowbirds, when you think about it from a evolutionary perspective, they place their eggs in other birds' nests because they used to migrate with the herds of bison in North America. So uh, the herds of bison were always on the move. So the cowbirds didn't have the opportunity to lay their eggs in a nest and, and rear them until they, they can fledge. They had to keep, they had to raise their birds on the run and they had to keep moving. And so uh, given that our bison herds in the United States are pretty much uh, gone for the most part, uh, we haven't been able to, uh, uh, you know, the cowbirds are still here and they're adapting. So it's, it's, no, it's no fault of their own. They're, they're doing what they were evolutionarily adapted to do. They're just struggling to, well, they're, they're just adapting at a faster rate than a lot of uh, the other native species can. It's, it's a native bird. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's from North America. It's just this weird, interesting interplay with kind of like when we, you know, you never know, like in an ecosystem where you take one piece away, you don't know the, the ripple effects that it will cause uh, throughout the, the animal and plant world after that. 
Thanks. Okay, two more and then I promise this it. Okay. Um, uh, Sarah and Ellen want to know, is the Korean spice bush good for birds? I don't have tons of experience with that species. Um, I will say that, um, you know, the Korean spice bush, to my knowledge, is not an aggressive species that is that we're finding that is spreading into natural areas and displacing native species. So it's probably okay. And I don't want to create the illusion that like, I don't want to come down. I'm not an, I'm not necessarily like an ecological purist who believes that we have a chance of transforming 100% of the plants in the United States to be native species. You know, that's, that's just simply not going to happen. Um, it's important for people to have connections, emotional connections to the plants that they're planting in their yard so that they want to see them uh, thrive and, and, and multiply and, and, and help uh, species. If you're finding that your Korean spice bush can help um, and that birds are eating it, it's not necessarily a, a, a totally bad thing. I would just say that we have to be careful when we plant things like uh, Brett Bradford or calorie pears or honeysuckles. These are species that have been documented to spread into natural areas and and degrade the ecosystem, the native ecosystems that have you know evolved for millions of years here. So, um, not all species, not all non-native species, are invasive species. It's important to remember that. Um, and so, uh, a Korean spice bush might not necessarily be uh, harming harming any birds. Uh, I don't know that they're that they're helping them per se. Um, but you know it's there's there's i'm not i'm I, i'm not necessarily encouraging you to remove it from your yard if it's something that you love um you know it's it's okay okay thank you and lastly um will the boom year that's coming up for cicada have any effect on birds in the affected areas which i understand uh -huh. it's actually more indiana than illinois but um yeah. yeah, yeah, brood brood X is coming. Yeah, and th there was actually an interesting article that was just written on this subject in on Audubon's website. Um, it's it's it was it was showing that uh, bird populations in areas near where the cicadas are are the seventeen year cicadas are so in the eastern United States that bird populations for like a period of like five to ten years after the cicadas hatch we'll see a spike in population size. And then as we get closer to the year 17, they start going down again, and then they'll pick back up again. So by, uh, you know, absolutely, this, the, the cicadas that are blooming are, or that, that, are, that will be emerging are going to be a bonanza for, for birds and for other animals uh, to munch on. So certainly the birds take advantage of it. Um, and it's this interesting phenomena that now, you know, they, they did a, a big meta, uh, they did a study looking at all of these other studies on bird population numbers, and they matched it up to the years when the, the brood X emerged. And sure enough, yeah, these bird numbers are going up and down based on the, the, the presence of, of the cicadas, which is pretty cool. It's feast time. All right. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, Hall, do you want to step on? Step on and, um, um, Sure. Yeah. Okay. I was just thinking maybe we ought to try some cicada. <laughs> the insects in Africa. Uh, because America has its own bird and Illinois has it, we thought it'd be fun in Glencoe to have our own bird. So we developed a list of 10 uh, candidates, if you will. And it, it, these are on the uh, Village of Glencoe website. Uh, some of these are just winter residents, some are year round, and some are just in the summer. But uh, I've already voted twice, and I would encourage you to vote, as they used to say in Chicago, early and often, to choose your favorite bird. Uh, the school system has voted already, and they have selected what they would like to be our, our favorite bird. I, uh, that's a secret, though. I won't, I won't tell right now but it's, a, it's one of the beautiful ones. Uh, the the house, house sparrow is not one of the 10 birds. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> but uh, we just thought it would be stimulating, educational and fun to have our own little contest. And so if you go to the village of glencoe.org slash STF, which stands for Sustainability Task Force, uh, we put that together. 
Uh, you can vote uh, again as often as you would like. The winner will be announced at the next webinar on birds on June 22nd. So uh, we encourage you to vote. And uh, there's also lots of information about each of the birds on the website. Uh, so you can learn more about the, the birds that you would like to. Uh, are there any uh, other questions, comments, Grace or Daniel? Um, I'm good. I just uh, want to thank everyone for coming and especially thank Daniel for a wonderful presentation. So um, thanks all everyone and um, good night. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Thank you, Grace.